Good morning. Today's scripture reading will be 1 Peter 2, 13 through 25. Please stand for the reading of God's word. Again, that's 1 Peter 2, 13 through 25. Be subject for the Lord's sake to every human institution, whether it be to the emperor as supreme or to governors as sent by him to punish those who do evil and to praise those who do good. For this is the will of God, that by doing good, you should put to silence the ignorance of foolish people. Live as people who are free, not using your freedom as a cover-up for evil, but living as servants of God. Honor everyone, love the brotherhood, fear God, honor the emperor. Servants, be subject to your masters with all respect, not only to the good and gentle, but also to the unjust. For this is a gracious thing, when mindful of God, one endures sorrows while suffering unjustly. For what credit is it if, when you suffer and are beaten for it, you endure? But if, when you do good and suffer for it, you endure, this is a gracious thing in the sight of God. For to this you have been called, because Christ also suffered for you, leaving you an example so that you might follow in his steps. He committed no sin, neither was deceit found in his mouth. When he was reviled, he did not revile in return. When he suffered, he did not threaten, but continued entrusting himself to him who judges justly. He himself bore our sins in his body on the tree, that we might die to sin and live to righteousness. By his wounds you have been healed. For you were straying like sheep, but have now returned to the shepherd and overseer of your souls. This is the word of the Lord. You may be seated. everybody. It's good to be back. Good to see a lot of familiar faces and some new ones. Um, but my wife Rachel and I, we're, we're honored to be back um, with you all, worshiping our great God together. And we're, as was said earlier, going to be continuing in our study in First Peter. I know my, my buddy Dunks, or Duncan, I guess is what you probably call him, um, shared, I think, last week. And so I'm going to pick up where he left off. I'm just always in my Duncan shadow, even, even in Dallas and even here now in Iowa. But we're excited to continue in this series of 1 Peter. But I wanted to start off today by telling you about the most disturbing place that I have ever visited in my life. I was about 20 years old, so about a lot of y'all's ages, and I was in Germany on a missions trip, and we were just outside of Berlin, and we had a free day, and so we went kind of on the outskirts of the city to Sachsenhausen Concentration Camp. It was a death camp where the Nazi party sought to exterminate many of its own citizens. And I can still remember walking past the gate. Remember it said, work shall set you free in German. And I remember walking past the shacks where the people were kept. I remember walking past the ovens where the corpses who perished were burned. And it was a place of an injustice that I could hardly comprehend. And the other frightening thing was is that when that camp was liberated, the Russian army then turned it into a death camp for Germans. And what maybe felt like justice was just prolonged murder. This was beyond evil. And sanctioned by a political party whose anthropology, whose understanding of what it is to be human was so distorted by sin. And yet it's so hard to imagine how any could have backed it. Yet there are many who did, even many in the church, who supported or just looked the other way. But not all. There were those like, Dietrich Bonhoeffer, who I'm sure many of you are familiar with, and others who did not sit idly by. Bonhoeffer said when the Nazi party was rising in power, he says, we must finally stop appealing to theology to justify our reserved silence about what the state is doing, for that is nothing but fear. Open your mouth for the one who is voiceless. And his doing so eventually led to his own execution. But he knew the heart of God as seen through Scripture, 
particularly the the heart of God for, for the marginalized and abused and neglected. And so there are people like Bonhoeffer, and even in our own country, you think of people like Martin Luther King, who stood up to the injustice that they saw. But are people like Bonhoeffer, MLK, and others, are, are they guilty of disobedience to passages like the one we just read? My answer is no. In fact, I think their understanding of passages like this, their understanding of their citizenship in a higher kingdom, made them better citizens in their temporary kingdom. Their understanding of their citizenship in heaven helped them to love those in this kingdom on earth who were suffering, but also even to love the ones who were the cause of that suffering. Loving the ones who made their own life difficult. My call is going to be the same for us today, to to love those who make your life difficult. And we can do so by wherever he might have you, by remembering that you are his, by serving honorably and suffering as Christ would have you suffer. And so first, I want to focus on that point of wherever he has you, remembering that you are his. And so looking back at the passage in verse 13 through 14, Peter begins this section with a really difficult command to these suffering Christians. He says, submit to every human authority. The very authorities that might be the source of the suffering you are presently experiencing. Now, it's likely at this point in church history that the persecution of Christians had not yet been mandated by Rome. But even so, Christians were not looked upon favorably. And things were only going to get worse. And so they might read this and think, I'm supposed to submit to that? Now, Peter, he's not advocating blind obedience. He's not advising that they serve as Rome's doormat. But he also acknowledges the political legitimacy of Rome. So too did Jesus. You remember the passage in Matthew 22 when the Pharisees and the Herodians tried to trip up Jesus and his words when they asked him about this tax that those who had been conquered by Rome had to pay to their conquerors. Remember what Jesus, he asked him, show me, show me a coin that you pay this tax with, a denarius, and how on one side it had the image of Caesar, and on the other side it would have had an inscription that praised the divinity of Caesar. And so in other words, these coins served as ancient billboards saying, Caesar is owed your tax, your money, but he's also owed your worship. And so how does Jesus respond to that delicate question? Well, he says, give to Caesar what is Caesar's and to God the things that are God's. Give Caesar back his coin, but yourself, your devotion, your worship, that is reserved for God. Even before Jesus' own crucifixion, he even acknowledges the political authority of Pilate, but always he acknowledged a higher power but a power that did not negate political submission, but it did negate political worship. Rome can receive your taxes, but your worship is reserved for God. Nowadays, in our present context, I think maybe we're a little less concerned about where our taxes are going, though it can still be frustrating. But I'm worried that today we're less aware of where our worship is going. Now, we can rest in the knowledge that there is no human institution that has been put in place outside of the sovereign control of our God. And that knowledge should lead us to submit to the governing authorities without worshiping them. And this freedom, it allows us to to love our country without worshiping it, and to love our country and still be able to address its faults. And in verse 15, Peter goes on to, to give them the why for this call to submission. He says, by doing good, you you should put to silence the ignorance of foolish people. Note that Peter, he's not advocating that we silence one's opponent by eliminating one's opponent. But also remember, this is coming from the same person who once sliced off someone's ear when the authorities came to arrest his friend, Jesus. And you remember what Jesus said to him at that moment? He said, Peter, put your sword back. Because all who take up the sword will perish by the sword. 
And here we have the same Peter who knows that these Christians, this minority group, they don't have the ability to overthrow Rome politically or militarily, nor should they. But through their good work, they can transform this empire. And this foolishness that Peter talks about them silencing, I think it likely refers to to some of the, the narratives that were spreading about Christians at this time. You see, in Rome, because Christians only worshiped one God instead of the Roman pantheon of gods, they were often considered atheists in the Roman Empire. Also, because the Romans had heard stories of these Christians gathering and then gathering together to eat Christ's flesh and drink his blood, there was these rumors going around that they were cannibals. And also, because they often in the church referred to one another as brother and sister, many were spreading rumors that they were guilty of incest. And how often is it that any time a culture is threatened by a minority group that's disturbing the status quo, we try to characterize them in a certain way that makes them look inferior and wicked. And that's what Rome was doing with the Christians. And so you can imagine if the Christians sought to promote some type of political upheaval, these narratives would have only intensified and spread. So how can they silence this foolishness? Through good conduct. Now, Peter, he's not denying that there is evil in Rome. He's not demanding that they do nothing about it but he's advocating that they go about it the right way. Referring back to Martin Luther King, while he was in prison, he wrote one of his most famous works, letters from Birmingham jail, put in jail because King was not going to remain silent amidst the injustice that people of color had been experiencing in this country, but he also was not going to stoop to the level of those who had shown him such wickedness. He wasn't going to use evil to overthrow evil. And while in prison, he once wrote, I have consistently preached that nonviolence demands that the means we use must be as pure as the ends we seek. So I have tried to make clear that it is wrong to use immoral means to attain immoral ends. But now I must affirm that it is just as wrong, or even more, to use moral means to preserve immoral ends. See, there's a reason that we're still talking about the impact of individuals like Dr. King. And that is because though evil often lives louder, good lives longer. Peter is not denying the evil in Rome, but he points his brothers and sisters towards a proper response. And part of that response is engaging as law-abiding citizens, as, as far as it doesn't contradict their allegiance to God. And many of them will be confronted with that challenge. And even Peter himself is going to be executed by this very government he is calling them to submit to because he would not be silent about who his ultimate ruler was. But before his death, those like Peter and Paul, being a servant of a heavenly kingdom did not result in dormancy in their earthly kingdom. In fact, it made them better servants. And so too for us today, may our allegiance to God's kingdom make us better servants in our earthly one. And in verses 16 through 17, Peter reminds them that though they are free from sin, that freedom does not permit absence where God has them now. Their identity as heavenly priests does not make them earthly dissidents. Their ultimate freedom ultimately means that they are slaves of God. And therefore, their engagement politically, at work, it becomes a realm in which to love their neighbor, not ignore him. And how does he command that love? He says, honor everyone, love the brotherhood, fear God, honor the emperor. So let's break that down. And what what might that look like for our own lives in 2024. Well, where are you called to honor everyone? Well, first, who is everyone? It's everyone. Who is that coworker or fellow student who drives you up a wall? We all have them. What would it look like to acknowledge their dignity and lift them up in honor? Fear God. Where has God placed you in this season of life? 
what classes, what job, what team, what group of friends, what dorm. What would it look like to live as if God actually cared about how you live in that realm? Because he does. Love the brothers and sisters. Brothers and sisters here. But let's think even specifically at your church. Where does your church have needs? How might you use the gifts that God has given you to meet those needs? You know, we often complain about the problems and the places he has put us. But if we spent as much time addressing those problems as we did complain about them, we would have a lot less to complain about. And finally, honor the emperor. I know we don't have an emperor today, but who has God placed in authority over your life? It could be a boss, a professor. How are you going to acknowledge the position that God has put that individual in and to honor them? Never enabling abuse. Hear me out there. We never enable or allow that. But how do we acknowledge the God-given task that as they go about that task in the right way, how do we help them do their task with as little grief as possible as far as it depends on you? What does it look like to live as free slaves of God? But it's not just about where he has you. It's not just about where you are. It's about whose you are. And wherever you are, Remember that you are his. Now, moving on in verse 18, Peter gets a little bit more specific about who he addresses. And he addresses the household slaves that made up a vast portion of the Roman world. And I think there's a few things that we need to address because I think today when we hear that word slavery, I think understandably, I think our minds ought to go to to antebellum south and the wickedness of, of plantation slavery. Now, in the Bible, in no place does it ever promote slavery. But sometimes when people read passages like this and they don't see an outright call for its destruction and abolition, people have used this book, the Bible, to say that the Bible, in fact, promotes it, or at least allows it. If you look at even in the history of our own country, it is sickening to hear of some of the stories that the ways that this book was used to promote something as evil as the enslavement of people of color. And you know, that's one of the reasons that I hope that you guys are here is to know what this book actually says so that you can protect us from reading this book in a way that destroys the dignity of other human beings. Do not misuse that stewardship. Let me tell you that each of you who are in this room, you already have more theological education than 95% of the world's Christians. Do not misuse that stewardship. Now, going back to Peter's world here, who were these slaves? One commentator, in helping us understand slavery in that time and culture, he said, people commonly entered Roman slavery as a result of capture and warfare, judicial punishment, piracy, or the international slave trade. In the first century, perhaps as much as 20% of the population of the empire was enslaved. Roman law made a slave the absolute property of the master, and thus slaves had no legal rights, including privacy or the rights to their own bodies. Another commentator goes on to say that slaves were found in all professions and generally had more opportunity for social advancement than free peasants. Unlike the vast majority of slaves in the U.S. and the Caribbean, they were able to work for and achieve freedom, and some free slaves became independently wealthy. This social mobility applies especially to the household slaves. Economically, socially, and with regard to freedom to determine their future, these slaves were often better off than most free persons in the Roman Empire. End quote. But even so, slavery was not the ideal for human flourishing. Later on, Peter in 1 Corinthians, he'll he'll say to his readers that were slaves, he says, if you can gain your freedom, avail yourself of that opportunity. Freedom was the better alternative and a greater reflection of the flourishing for which humanity was made. So with that understanding, 
I know this ancient situation may not be where we find ourselves today, though slavery is still a real thing that we must address. But regardless of where he has us today, I am confident that each of you have people in your life that have been placed in a position of authority over you. Let's just use your school involvement as an example. May I remind you that as students, it, it's never just you in the textbook. It's never just you and the professor. But God takes a special interest in your place of work and study and habitation. And so can I ask you, how are you living honorably here at EBC? How is this place flourishing more because you are here? You know, I think sometimes we find in Christian circles that because everyone is seemingly follow Christ, that there's less intentionality about living as salt and light. That's not the way it should be. And just as Peter calls on these household servants to help aid the flourishing of where they have been called, I hope and pray that wherever God has called you, whether that's in these hallways or as a barista at Charlotte's or maybe you're packaging packages at FedEx, I hope that those places are thriving more because you are there. And also just the city of Dubuque. I know many of you maybe don't consider this place as home. You may not be here long term, but it's where God has you now. And we are called to seek the good of the place where he has called us. Even thinking of your SLT, I know at times that that can just feel like an added weight that you don't have the bandwidth for. But may I challenge you not to see that as an obligation, but as an opportunity to pursue the flourishing wherever you might be serving. Who knows? People might see your good works and perhaps come to a place of glorifying God. And when we are mindful of God and the places he calls us, we are mindful of the same grace that we have received and therefore more willing to extend that grace to others. But I can promise you that wherever he has you, each of you are going to face experiences that are unfair, even in places that are for your good. People will seek to make your life difficult. That does not give us the right to make their life more difficult. Again, this does not permit abuse. If in any way you are experiencing any type of abuse, abandonment, neglect, that has to be addressed for your sake and also for the sake of those who could get caught in that trap after you. But again, even in places that are for our good, we'll experience things that are unfair, intended or unintended. But when one is mindful of God, we are also mindful of the mistreatment of one who went before us. But before we look at his example, I remind you again, wherever he has you, serve honorably. And finally, in verses 21 through 25, we are called to live as Christ would live. And this means, like Christ, that we are also called to suffering. Jesus went before us, setting us an example, but also empowering us to face suffering in a similar manner. He didn't suffer so you wouldn't suffer. In fact, if you want to follow Christ closely, the closer you will be to suffering on many occasions. But if you want to follow Christ closely, you will also be close to his comfort. You know, I think sometimes when we look at our life of discipleship, when we're called to follow Christ, we, we want to follow Christ as conquering king, but we don't so much want to follow Christ as the suffering servant as he's described to us in Isaiah. Do you remember when Jesus was arrested in Gethsemane? Remember his disciples? You know, they had hoped that he had come to overthrow Roman power, but as soon as he is arrested, where did they go? They scatter. What kind of discipleship are we wanting? The one that elevates us so that we can look down on all these others who are going to get what's coming to them? Or will we, like Christ, be willing to suffer so that other rebels, like you and me, might see that there's a better way? And his name is Jesus. Remember in Acts chapter 7, when Stephen was stoned to death, just before he died, it says he looked to heaven, he saw Christ, and he said, Lord, do not hold this sin against them. Echoing the very words of his Savior, who on the cross said, 
Lord, forgive them, for they know not what they do. I pray I would be willing to say the same for those who hate me. To live as Christ lived also means that we're called to entrusting. It says, when he was reviled, he did not revile. When he suffered, he didn't threaten, but continued entrusting himself to him who judges justly. Even though our God is just, he does allow injustice to happen in our lives. But we can entrust that injustice to the one who will take it into an account. Remember in that story that I just mentioned about Stephen, you remember who was in that mob that stoned him? Saul. Or we better know as Paul. I wonder how many times later on in his life when he was suffering for Christ, that he thought back to that moment when Stephen asked that God did not hold that sin against him. I know that Paul didn't give his life later until the Damascus Road, but I I think God was planting seeds with the suffering of Stephen. And who knows what seeds your own suffering could produce. As I said earlier, not only do we usually want to follow Jesus as a conquering king instead of a suffering servant, but Say it another way, we, also, we want to follow Jesus on his throne instead of Jesus on his cross. But what did Jesus tell his disciples? To take up their cross daily and follow him. But note that he did not say to take up his cross. His cross of justification is one that we could never carry. But because he carried his, we can carry ours. And to live as Christ lives It means we're called to suffering, to entrusting, but it means we're also called to and by a good shepherd. You know, we want the conquering King Jesus sitting on his throne more than the suffering servant on his cross. Or to put it another way, we often want to follow Jesus as a lion instead of Jesus as a lamb. But because Jesus was slaughtered as the lamb, we can live as lambs under the tender care of a good shepherd. We humans, like lambs, were prone to wander, prone to leave the God we love. But the one that we worship is willing to leave the 99 to come after the one. Maybe in your life right now, maybe you're wandering like the one. My call would be to come back, rest in him. I know it's hard. Life in this fallen world often feels unbearable. Though we walk through the valley of the shadow of death, we can fear no evil. For he is with us, and his rod and his staff can comfort us. So submit to his gentle care, which empowers an endurance that leads to character, which leads to a hope that will not disappoint. So wherever he has you, suffer as Christ would suffer. Loving those who make life hard for you. For some of you today, maybe that involves forgiveness, which is often a form of suffering. Because forgiveness always costs us. Tim Keller said that when when you forgive, that means you absorb the loss and the debt. You bear it yourself. All forgiveness then is costly. And so maybe this, what this looks like for you today is maybe there's a friend who didn't keep a secret, slandered you in another crowd, disappointed you, and trust yourself to the one who judges justly and forgive. It doesn't mean forget, but we can forgive. Maybe loving those who make life hard for you is giving your best effort in a class because we all know it. Our professors, though they love us, Sometimes those assignments are difficult, and it feels like they're intentionally trying to make us suffer. That's not the case. But even if you consider an assignment unfair or something you're just not interested in, how can you honor your teacher and your maker with the manner in which you go about your studies? Or maybe you work off campus. Maybe you're ridiculed for your faith. What if when that person who ridicules you, if they they need someone to cover their shift, you pick it up? and you silence their foolishness through your good work. 
Honor everyone. Love your brothers and sisters. Fear God. Honor the one in authority. And we can do that by wherever he has you, remembering that you are his, serving honorably, and suffering as Christ would suffer. Would you pray with me? Father, we thank you that we have a Savior who knows what it is to suffer. And Lord, even now when we come before you in prayer, you're not distant. You're not abandoning us and you never will. And so, Father, whether it's in the classroom or at work or at home, wherever it may be, help us to be mindful of your presence there, to fear you, and to honor everyone even if it comes at cost to ourself. And in doing so, Lord, if it be your will, through our good works, might we silence the foolishness and perhaps lead them to come to a recognition of the glory of our great God. Father, we love you. Thank you for how much you love these students. Would you help them as they go about the rest of their day, whether it's class or work, and as they head into this weekend? Lord, sustain him through this semester, we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Thank you.